Hello, hello everyone. It is Jackie with Pocket of Preschool and I am so excited that you guys are here with me tonight. So tonight we are talking all about transitions um, in your classroom, how to make them easier and seamless for all of your classroom, for you and for individual kiddos. So will you in the comments, oh, it's a little tricky, tricky question. I want you to think about your schedule and think how many transitions do you have in your day? So like I know one of my transitions is from circle time to hand washing. So think about how many transitions do you have in your day? Or maybe you have a transition time that you're struggling with. Um, so maybe shout that out in the comments so we can kind of um, problem solve together with you. Or maybe you have a transition idea that you love that helps you a lot. Share that in the comments too so we can um, help each other as a group because, you know, a billion heads are better than one. So tonight, like I said, we're talking all about transitions. And transitions can be tricky. I feel like it's kind of like your morning routine. It can either like make or break your day or your flow or like just how, like the mood. Um, so yeah, so we're just gonna talk about how to make it easier. What is a transition? So a transition is basically when you move from one activity to another one. I know a lot of people think cleanup, that's a big transition and that one's usually a tricky one um, for kiddos and for us. Um, so yeah, it's basically when you're just moving from one activity, you're switching gears and doing something else. And why are transitions hard? They can be hard for like a number of reasons, whether there's a problem behavior or maybe you're trying to get this group wrapped up with one thing and you're moving to another thing or maybe one kid doesn't wanna stop doing something or you know, a lot of things can happen during a transition. But they transitions can be hard. They can be stressful for you, for your kiddos. They can um, get, make, give your kiddos anxiety. Um, and they can cause challenging behaviors if you don't plan them out and really make sure um, that you have everything, you're kind of all your ducks in a row to make sure your transitions are seamless. So I want you, the first thing to do is to think about your schedule or if you have it printed, to look at it. Um, and if you want my to see my half day schedule, you can go to my blog and I'll actually, I forgot to put it in the top, but um, top comments, but I'll um, put my schedule, my daily schedule in the comments. So think about your schedule and do you have a lot of transitions or do you have kind of like the minimal um, and maybe you want to like rearrange your day a little bit because maybe you have a ton and maybe you can kind of switch a couple things around so that way you don't have as many. So one way, um, to make transitions easier is to have less of them. <laughs> um, so whatever you can do to make less transitions in your day and, and maybe you're not breaking every, you're breaking things up into too many pieces, try and make your, your schedule more, um, smoother and maybe group things together a little bit. That way you don't have as many transitions. Um, maybe like make center time longer instead of like breaking center time up in a half an hour and a half an hour, maybe put that together. And so instead of having two center times, maybe put it together because that'll eliminate one transition in your day. So another important thing to do is plan ahead, plan your transitions. So like I said at the beginning, one of my transitions is we have, um, kind of circle, well, we actually do music and movement and then we wash our hands and have snack. So that's one transition that I always plan an activity for. It's a quick, super, super duper quick activity, but it's another time I can sneak in learning. Um, but I literally put it in my lesson plans every week. So like this week we are doing actually a quick gross motor assessment with a pumpkin. So like I am checking on how they're balancing and all their, how they're hopping. Um, so, and how they're throwing. So I'm like literally like throwing them a pumpkin, having them throw it back to me, see if they're throwing it overhand, underhand, and I'm just quickly writing a note. Um, and, but I'll tell you more about that, how to do those activities um, in just a second. But so you wanna plan them. That way you're not just going, oh, what are we gonna do? And throwing something together really quick. You wanna make them meaningful because my, like, my transition, um, like I said, from music to hand washing, it's about five minutes. And if you put that in a week, like let's say um, you teach full day 
Um, that's five minutes every day. That's 25 minutes a week that you're getting, you're sneaking more learning in. Um, so, and that, and that adds up over the year um, to quite a bit of time. And you don't want to waste that time. You want to use that time because we all know that there's so much they need to learn and the expectations are so insanely high, which we all, <laughs> we can talk about that for hours, which we all think they're a little bit too high, right? Um, not always developmentally appropriate standards. Um, but it's what, what we got. So, um, so sneaking in every little, every little piece of learning we can. Oh, and I forgot to tell you too, um, when we were kind of talking about your schedule, it's important to have a visual schedule posted. That way, maybe you know that Billy is anxious and you can say, okay, I have it right over here. Let me show you really quick. I have it right over there. You see it? And it's in a pocket chart, and as we go, and actually I don't do it anymore, the kiddos are like, circle's over, I'm gonna take it out. But yeah, so they will go, oh, music's over, we, we're gonna take music out, and then they're like, oh, it's center time. So that way they know what comes next, and, it, and it's predictable. Um, that way they know what's coming, and they're not like, oh no, like they don't get nervous. Um, Cause not knowing what comes next, it creates anxiety for some kiddos. And I know even for me, if I don't know what's coming next, or if I don't know, like my schedule for the week, it just gives me anxiety. So um, have that visual schedule out. And if you need to, you can also do um, individual schedules. And this one is from when I taught full day, we had board maker in my school district. And it's literally one of those zipper, plastic zipper pockets. And you can do this with my visual schedule too. Um, you don't have to have board maker. You can just select the printing size on my visual schedule to print um, more to a page. Um, and I'll put the link in for how to do that in just um, after the video's over. But basically, it's just a little individual schedule. And there's, um, in, and it just has, they're on Velcro. And so that way they can have this with them, excuse me, in the classroom. And they can literally tear it off and then put it in. And then I have all the extra cards in here. And then you can reset it. Or they can reset it depending on um, the level of your kiddo. So yeah, so you can also do an individual schedule for a kiddo. That way they um, know what comes next and they can touch it and feel it and they can have it by them to um, give them less anxiety and then you'll have less problem behaviors. Um, yeah, so another visual you can have since we're talking about visuals, um, you can also do, I know cleanup is a tricky um, transition. So, you also can do like a five minute warning because let's face it, center time is so much fun or small group or whatever, whatever like your um, problem cleanup time is of the day. Um, you can even take these on the playground and these are in my cleanup um, character ed pack on Teachers Pay Teachers and I'll put the link in after we're done. But you can either have a kiddo do this, have them have the, this as their job. They can walk around and say five more minutes, five more minutes five more minutes, walk up to all the friends all the way around the room playing, screaming out, five more minutes to play. Some of those kids are so focused, they're not even he gonna hear you. So you wanna walk up and give them a visual with five more minutes and then it's cleanup time or five more minutes if you want, you know, depending on how, which one you wanna use. And I actually have three and I let the kiddos pick which one they wanna use. Um, but yeah, they can walk around, that way they know, okay, this activity is almost over and I need to mentally prepare <laughs> to stop and then move on. So, um, cause I mean, think about it for you. If let's say you are at home and you're like, oh no, I have to leave in five minutes. You can really quick gather your thoughts or finish whatever you're working on and then go, you know, leave and go do whatever. But if you look at the clock and you're like, oh my gosh, I have to go now. Like you're in what, in panic mode sometimes if you're like me um, and you let time get away from you. Oops, sorry about the shake. You let time get away from you, you're like, oh no, and you're running around panicking because you need to leave right then and you don't have everything done and you can't collect your thoughts and it's blah. It's basically your, your problem behavior, right? <laughs> when, you, when you're going through that. So we don't want to do that to our kiddos. And if you need to, set a timer on your phone. Um, there's a lot of apps you can use um, for setting timers. You can literally set a timer in your classroom, one of those visual ones. You can do set a timer, one of those old school cooking timers. You can do, I know the, on the smart board, you can set a timer on there as well. But that way, if, if you are one of those people that, gets, that loses track of time, set a timer and then when it dings, you know to go around and tell everyone five more minutes that way 
your kiddos can then prepare to finish and finish cleaning up. And then I also, in that cleanup pack, um, if I have a class that's struggling with cleanup, some years it happens, some years it doesn't, or maybe you have one kiddo who's struggling with um, cleanup time, um, read them this social story about cleanup time. And it just breaks it down in super simple language about how we have to play at school and sometimes we have to stop. And, you know, um, the teacher walks around with the five more minutes and it just kind of goes slowly um, through all the, all the routine. And I actually also have a visual of our cleanup routine and you can do visuals um, of your cleanup routine to um, help with it. Cause you can be like, and then you can like walk around with this during cleanup time and be like, oh stop, it's time to clean up. And don't forget, we, um, so every, I know everybody's different and um, for how they clean up, like what's their cue? I know some people use those doorbell ringers, those um, mobile ones, and they, people like clip it to their lanyard or whatever. Um, but I actually just turn on it a kid's bop song that's upbeat and fun, and the kids usually know it, and they're singing it. And they, when they hear that song, it's their visual, um, or their visual, their, it's their cue, it's not visual because they're hearing it, so it's an auditory cue that, oh, it's time to clean up and let's go. And I pick a song that is fast, like has a fast tempo, so that way they kind of move to the beat, clean up fast to the beat. Because um, if you pick a slow song, they're gonna clean up really slow <laughs> to the beat. Not even meaning to, it's usually unintentional. It's just kind of how your body works. Um, especially if you're a music friend that you love that music, you're gonna clean up to the tempo of it. Um, and I pick a song they know because after they clean up, they get to come to the carpet and just dance. So that way they're getting their wiggles out and it's 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 an easy reward, right? They just get to go dance on the carpet. Like, it, I don't have to give out stickers. <laughs> I don't have to give them, like, I don't have to make sure I give everyone a high five when they come to the carpet, which I do give them high fives, don't get me wrong. But they can just come to the carpet and I can be helping somebody else who had maybe made a big mess and needs some extra support. Um, I can help them and then when they're done, they come to the carpet and they can clean up and they can dance and then they get rewarded and they get to have fun and they get their wiggles out before we sit down for the next activity. So it kind of works great for um, everything. And I just um, have, I use kids bop CDs and it's just whatever popular song that is preschool appropriate um, that, that I, I do know if I, I have tried doing like Go Noodle and playing on the smart board. If I do any, well, I don't have a smart board, sorry. I have a TV that plays my computer with um, a Chrome stick or whatever. Um, or a Chrome Fire, Amazon Fire Stick, one of those things, um, it plays whatever's on my computer on the TV. If I do something like that, they stop cleaning up and they just watch the music video. So, um, and some people are asking me which song, and I usually let them pick, or I pick out a good song that I know that they hear on the radio a lot, so it just, I just pick whatever, whatever fast, upbeat song that they like. Um, and then sometimes I change it up just so it doesn't get boring and the same one over and over. Um, so they get, are excited to dance to it. And our other rule is, is after you clean up your little space, walk around the room and you have to find a friend and help them clean up. That way, I don't have 10 kids dancing on the carpet and I have like four kids playing in the center because they have a giant mess. Because then they get kind of sad and maybe they'll wander and clean up or wander away from cleaning up and they'll come dance. So that way, um, to avoid that and to build empathy and to build you know, a classroom community, after they are done cleaning up their little space, they walk around the room, find somebody else to help, and then, every, you know, then everybody can come to the carpet together. It just builds community, it builds those friendships, it just helps them have a caring heart that, oh, I can help somebody before you know, I get rewarded just because I cleaned up doesn't mean I'm done. Like I wanna go help my friend, so that way my friend can join me um, and do that. And that way too, I always notice, it always ends up is everyone is helping in the block center, <laughs> or pretend. That's the two places that usually are, are the slowest to clean up because it's kind of like the most stuff they get out, right? So everybody always ends up in blocks helping or in pretend helping. And it's just it just creates that caring classroom community. And it's we do it from day one. So it's nothing like, oh no, like, oh, I have to go help them. I don't, I don't get that. Like, it's just like, they're like, oh, 
you know, or they'll shout out. They'll be like, oh, Billy needs help and pretend. Can anybody come help us? And then it's so cute. They'll like walk over and they'll go help their friend or they'll help clean up around the sensory table. So things like that. So that's just a really fun um, cleanup trick that I love. It's just to kind of build that in that even though you're cleaned up, you go help a friend and then everybody gets to come dance. And it, has, it works really well and it gets those wiggles out because I try and to, um, I do like a very active activity like, um, or like a not teacher directed every activity. So we do like center time and then we do small group. So they get to kind of be independent make their own choices and then small group, which is very teacher directed. So that way after centers, they get to jump around and dance for a little bit, get those wiggles out so they can sit down and do an activity too. So it also helps for that. And all of this is in my cleanup pack, but you can make it too for your own classroom. And then if my classroom is really, really struggling and they need extrinsic rewards, because sometimes, let's face it, some classes and some kiddos need those extrinsic, ex, is that, I'm saying that right, right? Um, those um, tangible rewards. Um, and they, like a high five does not work for them. And that's okay. You can start out with tangible rewards and then, you can um, like slowly fade those away as the year goes on. That way a high five will work later. But I do um, sometimes give out, or if maybe like we're struggling with cleaning up for a while and everybody is literally leaving everything in the classroom and coming to dance instead, I'll just start, I'll just quietly give out these cleanup rewards. Um, little, it says, um, Clean up superstar. I just, I'll go around and be like, wow, you're clean up, you're a clean up superstar. Thanks so much. And then I'll, or um, I don't do it really quietly, sorry. I said the opposite. I do it very loudly. Oh my gosh, you're cleaned up. That way, it's kind of like that pivot praise. I'm yelling almost about how awesome this kiddo is because what do they do when they see a teacher is complimenting a friend? They try and do it too, right? That way, you're pointing out positive behavior and then they go do it too. And then you got everybody cleaned up because everybody wants this little silly, silly to us, but it's really sometimes very meaningful for them. A silly little superstar cleanup award. No big deal. So super simple. And then I, because I actually, I don't use a treasure box in my classroom. So that way, this is, this is about as much of a reward as they get as little beads of paper from me on occasion. So another thing that I do when we're transitioning is wherever they're going to, I try and have visuals there. Like, I'll use this probably example all the time because this is one of the big, our big transitions that um, can either, that is, um, it's a longer transition and there's more steps to it. So like the transition from music, wash your hands and sit down at snack. Um, it, so they do their transition activity and they go one at a time to wash their hands for snack. And in the bathroom, I have a visual routine of how to wash their hands. And this is in my Teachers Pay Teacher store as well, in the hand washing thing, in the hand washing pack. Um, so that way they go in there and they're not like, oh gosh, what do I do? Like, or they do stuff out of order or they just go in the bathroom and play. Um, they go in there and they know, even if they're not like using it, like, going, oh, I, I do this first and second. They're at least seeing it on the wall and go, oh yeah, I came in here to wash my hands. And then they'll look at it as, cause I have it right above the faucet. So like the faucet's right here and then it's right above it. And then on the paper towels, I have another visual to help them be successful. One, two, stop. They get one, two paper towels and they have to stop. So not only have visuals wherever you are doing the transition, if they have to transition and do something else, have visuals over there. That way they can be successful independently. And if they need a visual support, it's already there. You don't have to run over and be like, oh, here, here you go. <laughs> like it's already there. And they know it and they use it. Um, and then like at the snack table, I have this right above the snack table. Um, it says like, eat my snack, we sit at the table, try to open things, throw trash away, stack the dishes. Cause we use um, real dishes for a snack. So, most of the time, unless it's like a granola bar, then we don't. But anyways, <laughs> this is in my snack and lunch character ed pack. I have lots of visuals in my character ed pack, 
we, I'm a visual girl. Like we, visuals are, are so awesome for kiddos. It just helps so much. It's just a visual cue. That way, if you're not there, they can just look at that and they're good to go. So that way, they do the transition activity with me and I'm in circle helping the other kids transition one at a time with doing the transition activity. They're in the bathroom washing their hands independently. They can sit at the table and then this is right there for them when they need that reminder. So they're doing activity with me. There's a visual in the bathroom and there's a visual at snack. And maybe you do like um, something different. Maybe you do like, um, maybe after this they go do like table time or um, they go do um, like small group or you know those um, fine motor tubs or whatever it is. But have those out that way they know that's the routine. So somebody asked how I make these visuals. So I make all of these on PowerPoint and I buy all my clip art off of Teachers Pay Teachers um, from some amazing clip artists. Um, so the hand washing is in the hand washing pack and I'll link that after I'm done. The snack is in the snack and lunch pack. And then the cleanup routine is in the cleanup um, pack and it's in all if you want all of them it's in my character ed bundle oh and then some people are asking about snack so when my kids my kiddos transition to snack snack is already on the table for them um, and like if it's something like if it's something in a bowl I put a napkin over it that way there's no cross contamination and I have we actually have name rocks and there's name rocks at the table because I have some kiddos who have allergies. That way they sit at the right spot because some of my kiddos can't have milk. Um, so that way they sit at the right spot and they're getting the right snack for them, for allergy friends. Um, we want to have visuals wherever, wherever, as many visuals as you need to help them be successful. And then you want to plan ahead. So plan those activities, those transition activities. And then you want to have those act that activity ready. All right, I think we're gonna jump into some fun activities that are like my go-to transition activities um, that are fun. So yeah, so we're gonna jump into that. So I'm at circle, my circle area. So some transition, let's talk about tra fun transition games. So I always try and plan them. Like I said, each week we do the same one all week or maybe we do the same one for like three days and then we'll do another one. And it really depends, I kind of relate them to our theme. Um, so, and sometimes I do them to introduce a game, um, but sometimes I just do them because they're fun and we need to work on letters. So I'm gonna move this over here so you can kind of see. So this is a little pocket chart from the, it's from the, from the Target dollar spot at the beginning of the year. And I just have, so these are my letter posters just printed four to a page. And if you go into Adobe, um, when you go to print anything, and this works for letter posters, anything you print, in a, any Adobe file you can print, just select, um, when you select print, do um, multiple to a page and you can print more to a page. But these are just alphabet posters printed four to a page. And you can just do like hide the letter and you can do like themed letter posters or maybe you have like, maybe you have letter cards for your theme you're doing. Like these are from my fall pack. You can put these in there and then all you do is you can, you say, everybody close your eyes. And you say, I'm gonna hide, I'm gonna hide the heart. And then one at a time, the kiddos come up and say, is it under the E? And then they can look and they'll say, nope, it's not under the E. And then they can say, oh, is it under the A? And you go, oh, nope, not under the A. So what are they doing? They're saying the letter name or if you're, you have older kiddos, you can be like, I want you to say the sound or you can do this with number cards if you have two-year-olds you can do this on the carpet. So if you have two year olds, I know um, you probably don't wanna put anything on a pocket chart, put it, put these cards literally on the floor and then you can hide it under it on the floor. That way they're not having to come up, they can just, cause I know a lot of toddler teachers do everything on the floor with them. Or if you're a preschool teacher and you do everything on the floor, have everybody sit around you and like a you and then do it that way too. So it's just a fun um, little game you can play to like hide the letter. That's really fun. I'm just gonna use some of the stuff that we're actually doing right now. So I will put these away for a second. So maybe you're you're working on syllables. So I'm just gonna, let me turn this again. So, and you can use this with any really game you have where the turns are kind of quick. Oh, I don't know where the one syllable one went. 
So you can have them pick a card and then they can clap it or stomp it or whatever you want to do. And they can say like vegetables, vegetables, three. And then they would put it up. And actually, I, I, I forgot to tell you this part. So we do an animal walk to as a transition so if you have a bigger room and you have the space have them do an animal walk because one it slows them down two they're using their muscles um so that helps them get some of those wiggles out and helps them get some of that um sensory input in especially if you have kiddos who need heavy work um this is great a great transition for them have them do bear walks to um, the bathroom, have them do crab walks to the bathroom, have them do frog jumps, have them any kind of walk, have them, you know, pretend to bounce like a pumpkin for like, that's what we did this, um, today. We I'm like bounce like a pumpkin or maybe, you know, hop on one foot like a scarecrow, you know, just make them up of whatever, or the kids can make them up. But that way, if they're doing an animal walk, so they do this and then they do their animal walk to the bathroom to go wash their hands. They're getting in some gross motor. They're building those muscles because we all know as there's more and more technology comes out, their muscles are getting weaker and weaker because they're not playing outside as much. Or in the winter too, it's great because they're getting more of that um, um, sensory input in. Um, I don't, as people are asking me if I have a transition pack, I don't, but I will add it to my, uh, my to-do list. So yeah, that way I can put all these things in one pack for you. So yeah, okay, so yeah, so they, so this is um, this game is just in my fall math and literacy centers pack. So you can do this with a ton of games. Like just put the headers in a little quick pocket chart, and then you can just take it down. I love these little itty bitty pocket charts from Target, or like I think the dollar store has them sometime. Um, they work great for little transition activities, or maybe and anything I do in a pocket chart you can do on the floor. It's just um, kiddos can see better, and then. When I do it in the pocket chart, because my kids sit in like a, like I have little squares on the carpet they sit on, everybody can see that way we're not transitioning again from sitting in their, on their little spots to sitting in a U, because that would be adding another transition in, and we don't want to do that. <laughs> um, we just want to keep our class going. Okay, and so maybe you have just a letter game, and maybe you're just going to put your letter cards in, and then they're going to come up, and they're just going to put match up the letter. So that's another, if you have a letter game, or maybe you're, maybe this is a game in your library center, or maybe they're not playing it. Um, do it as a transition activity to get them excited about it. And um, they, the, the, they remember it's there, and then they'll, you're also getting, sneaking in more letters and sounds. And you can also differentiate. So maybe your younger learners, oh, you couldn't see that, sorry. Maybe your younger learners are matching er, up the letters, and maybe your kiddos who are ready, or maybe if you have kinder kiddos, uh, maybe they're matching up the sounds. So A, F, or A, corn, sorry, that's a long vowel. Um, so yeah, A, corn, or maybe they're doing just the letters. So it's really easy to differentiate this stuff too, or if you're doing like that syllable card game, um, give, you know, you know which words are long. Give the, the kiddos who can handle the longer letter, longer letters, longer words, the longer words. You, you know, you're the one deciding who um, goes. My circle area, and I'll put a picture of this in after we're done. I actually bought a outdoor carpet, and it's like a neutral color from Target um, on clearance at the end of summer. And I put a grid on it with duct tape. And that way they have their own little box they get to sit in so they can visually see where their space ends and their friend's space is. And then I just wrote their names on tape. So yeah. All right. Another fun thing to do is, um, I know a lot of us do counting stews. So if you have a new counting stew out for your new theme, do a counting stew as your transition. So what they do is, you would pick a recipe card and each call a kiddo up. Oh, your job is to do one vine. And they would put in one vine into their bowl. And then three, the next, call the next kiddo and they would put three scoops of pulp. So one, two, three. And then that kiddo would do an animal walk to wash their hands. And then um, the next kiddo, call the next kiddo and they would get five green pumpkins. And you guys, if you ever want green pumpkin counters, just spray paint some pumpkin counters you already have. These are, these green pumpkins, I just sprayed these green. 
So if you ever want to do, ever want some green pumpkins. So you put in one, two, three, four, five, and then they would mix it up, take it out, and then pick a next recipe card, and then the next friend will do the next one. So if you do rest, and then, and if anybody is wondering, these are called counting stews. I have a whole bundle of them, um, and they're in my Teacher's Pay Teacher store, and they're, they're um, for tons and tons of themes. I mean, it's, I think the pack's all over like 250 pages. I mean, there's a lot of them. So, yeah. um, another fun thing you can do is if you have these letter tubs, I know a lot of us have these letter tubs, um, dump them out. What you can do is um, dump out the letter tubs and then they come up and they just pick one of the items and they go, is it, does it begin with R or does it begin with T? And they sort it back. Oh, and so I, when I taught full day, I had 18 kiddos a day. And when I had these transition activities, I would always, um, if you have a kiddo who knows, who you know, you can't sit very long, call them like, you know, you know, first or third or fourth, and you pick the kiddos who you know can sit longer, um, pick them like last. <laughs> um, or maybe you see a kiddo is getting really squirrely, pick him and, and have him come up or pick her and have her come up. Um, so yeah, so I, and I, I always, when I did these transition activities with 18 kiddos, I just made sure it was short. Um, that way they weren't sitting for more than five minutes. And these transition activities only lasted five minutes. And it, another reason is whatever activity they're going to go do, like wash their hands is the one, you know, my transition I've been talking about. Um, that way everyone is not at the, in the bathroom at once because in my full day classroom I had 18 kids, two sinks. I was very, very lucky and had two sinks. And then in my half day classroom I have eight kiddos and I have one sink, but it still gets backed up. So yeah, so if you have these, expensive letter tubs from Lakeshore or Amazon. Um, yeah, just dump it out and then they can pick an object and sort it. Does it go in the R tub or the T tub? Um, and, or maybe you have to use three tubs because you have more kiddos. Um, another fun thing to do is work on some social emotional. So this is my calm down bucket and every once in a while or every like mm, two months or so I put something new or maybe I find something new to put in. Um, I, or maybe we're struggling with calming down. I'll say, you know what? I put something new in our calm down bucket. And so today for transition, I'm going to let you pick something out of the calm down bucket and you get to practice or play with it for, you know, a little bit and then, you know, sit down. So I, so I would just put like these three things on the carpet and say, okay, we got our new bubble machine. I have a sequence thing. And then these two things are already in there. So they can come up, they can go, and you can say, okay, you're gonna go one, two, three, stop, and then they put, you know, put it down, or that you can like say, oh, look, I want you to, you know, see how, oh, does that feel good? Does that like make you feel calm? Look how pretty that is. I'm sure that would help you calm down when you were upset. Um, or, oh, look at this squishy ball, ready? One, two, three, stop, and then they would put it down and the next person would go. Um, so you can do it on social skills stuff too. You don't have to always do it on literacy and you don't always have to do it on math. You can definitely do it on building some of those social emotional skills. Maybe you're, maybe you're coming back from spring break and you want to review green and red choices, pull some of them off. Stuck. That one was really stuck. <laughs> and just put them on the carpet and say, oh, you know what? I need your help. These fell off of my board and I need your help putting them back on. Do you, can you guys help me? I'm gonna call you guys up one at a time and I want you guys to put it is on the green choice board or the red choice board. <gasps> oh my gosh. And then as you're going through, you can talk about it, you know, real quick. Oh, we have a calm body. Oh, as he's putting it up. Oh, yep, we have a calm body so other people can learn. Thanks, Billy. I use Billy a lot, <laughs> sorry. And then they can do an animal walk to wash their hands. So you can do super simple stuff like that. If you're having behavior issues, um, have them sort your green and red choices. And if you want to know more about green and red choices, I can put the link in after we're done. It's just my behavior management strategy I use. Um, another fun thing to do is a dice. Super simple. Roll the dice. They can roll the dice in the middle of the carpet, and they can do that many jumps or that many hops or that many jumping jacks or that many um, whatever <laughs> gross motor activity or whatever thing you're gonna do or that many claps. They can, you know, it practices counting, it gets them moving. 
Um, and then that's I wanted to, that's a really good segue for what else I was gonna tell you. Um, so I use like this week we did we used our pumpkin and I did what I call quick learning checks. So I don't know about you, but gross motor is really hard for me to assess. I know when I was in college, they're like, oh, set up an obstacle course. And you know, you can watch your kiddos go through and, and you can just write down how they're doing. Well, that, that must be in an ideal world. Either that or every class I've ever had is crazy, <laughs> one or the other. Because I don't know about you, but if I set up an obstacle course, I'm having to help manage kids go through that obstacle course, or maybe like the hula hoop, they're bouncing through hula hoops and one hula hoop went flying because they landed on it. Oh, sorry about that shake. They landed on it funny. If I'm doing an obstacle course, there's no way I can sit <laughs> and do observations <laughs> and get an assessment from that. They're really fun to set up. It's a great gross motor game, but I've never been able to do a um, observation if they're doing an obstacle course. And maybe that's just me. I don't know. So what I do instead is I do a fun, I do it as a fun transition activity. So this is my assessment binder. So I just open it up to the gross motor section and like this one is hops. And so I say, okay, I want you, I'm gonna give you the pumpkin and I want you to hop, hop on one leg 10 or, you know, five, oh, it says five, three to five times for a five-year-old. That's the benchmark I have in my assessment book. So say, I want you to hold the pumpkin and I want you to hop on one leg five times. And then the whole class counts and, I'll, and we'll go one, two, three, four, five. And if a kiddo needs me to hold their hands, I can hold their hands and they can hop one, two, three, four, five. And then I can really quick write down if they could hop, if they attempted to hop, if they hopped on one, hopped once with a, on their preferred leg, or if they hop three to five times on one foot, I can quickly mark it. And then I, the other assessment I have is jumps, which is jumping on two feet. I'll say, okay, I want you to jump on two feet all the way to wash your hands. And then I can watch them jump like two or three times, quickly mark that, and then I have that gross motor done. Um, another one we did this week was, um, my, um, my balancing and I did the same thing. Okay. I want you, I have this pumpkin and I want you, oh, we didn't put it on our head. Sorry. <laughs> that's, that's, that's the apples up on top, isn't it? <laughs> Dr. Seuss book. I just want you to hold it and I want you to try and balance on one foot while holding the pumpkin or if you need to put your arms out, you can, and we're going to see how long you can do it. And just by put, giving them a pumpkin, they were like, oh, okay, and they had fun, and they loved like counting while everybody did it, and I could super quick mark my assessment, and I could actually watch them do it rather than doing an obstacle course. I really can't watch anybody very well, and I really don't have time to write it down. Um, but yeah, so you can use it for quick learning checks. Like let's say you're playing that syllable game I showed. Um, you can open to your literacy section in your assessment book or whatever you have, or maybe you're playing a rhyming game. You can really quick write down how they did. And it's just really quick. And I always usually go from the top to bottom on my assessment book if I'm doing an assessment. That way I don't have to really fast find the name because when I had 18 kids, it took me a minute. But that way I go, okay, you know, who's first? Billy. Okay, you come up and find one. Oh, great, he did it. And I can just real quick mark it down. And people are asking about my data notebook. So this is for sale in my Teachers Pay Teacher store. And it is based on research and standards. Um, I will put the link in at the bottom. And I also have a video on my assessment data binder and um, how I do assessments and how I do student portfolios. If you go to the top of this post, all of my Facebook Live videos are linked there. So it has a list of all the topics and you can click there. So yeah. And it's, it's, it's really awesome to use and it makes assessing so much easier and makes using your assessments so much easier when you're planning. Oh, so somebody was asking about the colors. Thanks, Kelly. Kelly added in, so why do I have different colors? So I have different colors because it's um, like I use one color for August and September. So pink is August and September. And then like um, I use orange like for, I use orange like oh, October, November, December. And then like for the next like maybe um, January, February, March, I'll use another color. And then April, May, I'll use another color. That way I know what quarter I did them in. And I usually do my assessments. I do want, I try and do 
um, the big ones um, in August. And then I try and do them again um, before parent-teacher conferences so I can see growth and make sure there's growth. And or, you know, if we're not growing, I can, I can figure that out before I have parent-teacher conferences. And then I do another set, January, February. And then I do the last set before parent-teacher conferences. And I have my parent-teacher conferences since I get to make my own schedule. I do them in April. So another fun thing to do is, um, let's say you're, um, like my little first grader, he was learning about bats this week. And maybe you wanna see if they can recall any facts from the book. Maybe you read a nonfiction book and you wanna see if they can recall any facts from the book. These amazing little microphones, this one says it's from Lakeshore. Hmm. Um, oh, I think I bought this one at the teacher store. But sometimes they have these at the dollar store, but they're, they're just, they echo. They echo. <laughs> and then, um, so I usually say, oh, can you tell me one fact from the book? And if they have this microphone, then they get super excited. And if they're super quiet, they can whisper it and it'll make their voice louder. So if they're super shy, it's not as scary and they can be quiet and the, their friends can hear them better. But it's just a fun way for, to get them talking or say, or, or maybe you want them to share about the weekend. like. Maybe you want to build your community or maybe, you know, some kiddos aren't getting along or maybe, you know, you just feel like you need to do some relationship building. Give them this microphone and say, hey, I want you to tell me something you're really good at or tell me, tell me your favorite animal or something you love or something you did this weekend. You know, whatever. Have them share and then they can go do the transition or go do an animal walk and then wash their hands since I'm using that one as my example. So, yeah. So these are, um, I actually saw these at the dollar store, like last week, because I'm there all the time. Alrighty, I'm trying to think. Anything else? Oh, you know what else I love to do? Is I love to use post-it notes. So let's say, let's say you're voting on a name for your class pet, or you're voting on a name for your class stuffed animal, or... Maybe you're having a Halloween party and they get to vote on what snack to have. Uh, right, oh, I wanna tell you, right here, see this little like crate? In here I have some like random things. So I have like my teacher markers and then I have a bucket of post-it notes. So let's say we wanna vote. So I say, okay, let's do it. And I just really quick, you can either um, have chart paper or you can just be like, okay, let's do this. So. And then it's also fun to model that they can graph and they can take data at any time. So say, okay, you guys, do you want to have cookies or cupcakes? And y'all, your drawing doesn't ever have to be the best because their drawing is, you know, a little drawing. So, or you can have a kid come up and draw it too and say, okay, if you want cupcakes, I want you to put... When I call your name, you're gonna put a yellow post-it up, and if you want, or cookies, and if you want cookies, or whatever it is, you're gonna put up a yellow one, and as they come up, they take which color they want, and then look at this. You have a graph, so now you're doing math, they're counting, you are collecting data, and you're modeling how to make a graph and collect data, and then maybe after, um, while everybody's at the snack table or something, you can be like, oh my gosh, look, look, at, look at our chart. Which one has more? Which one has less? And you can, it's also a great way to teach about um, a democracy and how we vote on things. And even, you know what? Even if we don't like the results, it is what it is. A majority wins. So yeah, it's just a great, um, great thing to teach about. So it's a great way to include social studies and it's great for teaching math and science with data. So just put a big bucket of post-it notes. And I have one little girl who loves graphing <laughs> and loves doing these little graphs. And she will think of the most random things and be like, oh, you know what, Miss Jackie, I, I, I really want to know like who likes, who likes puppies and who likes kitties. Like if we're doing a pet theme, and I'll be like, great, let's do that as our transition because one, she's taking ownership and two, she is taking charge of her learning and she's excited about it. So guess who's gonna be excited about making this, this graph? The class and her friends because it was her idea. And it's just, you'll see them too if you do these a lot, um, take a little clipboard and they'll start making their own graphs and you can, use, you can teach tallies this way too. It's just really fun. Um, but yeah. So all kinds of fun stuff. And two, it's a great way to show that you care about them and you you love them so much and you care about them and you um, 
Like this is their classroom too. If they wanna do something and they wanna know something about their friends, that you do that as an activity because I mean, wow, like gotta build those relationships first. Otherwise, cause if they don't trust you and if you, they don't know you love them and that the, your classroom is a safe place, then lots of learning can happen. So yeah, so make sure you're building those relationships. I know, well, random things sometimes, right? <laughs> I throw in these Facebook lives. And another thing, cause a, pe a lot of people say, it's not really so much at this point in the year since we're kind of in the fall, but um, at the beginning of the year, a lot of kiddos don't know how to trace, at least um, my, my little three. So they say, they don't know how to trace. Like how am I supposed to just get them to trace and trace letters and they're just scribbling all over it. They don't know what to do. So we do um, the first, some in the first month, um, we do a lot of tracing as our activity. And guess what we use? We use the first letter in their name. So I'll be like, okay, since I'm using Billy tonight like crazy, I'll be like, okay, I'm gonna write a B on my board. And then when I call you guys up, you guys either get to pick the pink or the green marker and you guys get to trace it. Because what you're doing then is you're one, teaching the letters, teaching the kiddos names, and you're teaching them how to make the letter correctly. So you can be like, let me flip it a little bit. So you can be like, okay, I'm gonna go line down, bump, bump, or whatever language you use um, for yours. And be like, okay, you get to either pick the pink marker or the green marker, and you guys are gonna trace it. And then if you, one, you can do hand over hand with them so you can help them trace and be like, okay, when we trace, we go right over the letter. So that's how I introduce like what tracing is. Um, you can do this with shapes. You can do it with even like a, like a line. Like maybe you're not, I don't know where my eraser went. Maybe, you're, um, maybe you have um, little guys and you're like, okay, this is a long line down. I want you to trace my long line down and I want you to start at the top and go all the way down. So maybe you're teaching starting at the top or you wanna reinforce that. Or you can do like a bumpy line Or you can do different types of lines too. It doesn't have to be letters. Um, it can be, it's up to you. But do, do what works for you and what your kids need and what, um, what they're ready for. So yeah. So I think those are almost all of my tips and trips. Trips, tips, tips, trips. <laughs> I guess it's time for me to be done since I can't talk anymore. <laughs> Okay, so those are all of my tips and tricks um, for transitions. And again, if you want links to my old, or not old, my past Facebook Live videos on like assessments or the fall theme or whatever it is. So those are the top of this post and I have just a list that makes them easy to find for you. There's also a link to my Teachers Pay Teacher Store, a link to our Facebook group. So if you wanna continue the conversation over there, maybe you have a question and I, that I missed or maybe you just want more than my opinion, which is would be fine with me, um, go over in the Facebook group and get everybody else's opinion too because that group of teachers is awesome and we share all things Pocket of Preschool. All right, well, you guys have an awesome night. I hope your transitions are amazing. Um, and yeah, see you guys later. Bye.